Oak Street this morning, whether you're here or online or listening on the radio, thank you for joining us. We're going to stand together. We're going to open this uh, service with a song. Come to the water, you who thirst, and you'll thirst no more. Come to the Father, you who work, and you'll work no more. All you who Love is here, love is now, love is pouring from his hands, from his brow. Love is near, satisfied, streams of mercy flowing from his side, cause love is here. Amen. You guys have a seat. Good morning. Man, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. My name is Stephen. I'm the student pastor here, and I'd like to welcome you to our worship service this morning at Oak Street Baptist Church. So those of you in person and those of you online and on the radio, welcome. We're glad that you're here with us today. If you are new here, if you haven't been here um, before or you've only been here once or twice, in the seat back in front of you, you're going to find a welcome packet. It has some information about who we are as a church, the things that we believe, and most importantly, there's a little tear-off section in there. If you wouldn't mind filling that out for us and dropping it in one of the offering boxes on your way out of the service today, we would love to get in contact with you this week, answer any questions you may have, 
just let you know how grateful we were that you chose to join us in worship today. If you would go ahead and open your bulletins with me, um, there's some things I'd like to draw your attention to. First off, um, this is not in your bulletin, but this is outside. We have these awesome, you are invited back to church cards um, that are in the back and they are at the guest booth and then some of them are on this uh it's not a desk it's like a drawer thing i the words escaping me right now i don't know <laughs> a cabinet that's that's thank you bill thank you so much the cabinet out there um we've got these wonderful things so it's got you're invited back to church and then love is contagious on the other side. And so, uh, grab some of these today. When you go out to lunch, leave a generous tip and then leave one of these with them. Invite your waiter or waitress to lunch and, and just give them out to any, any person you, you see fit. Um, Easter is the number one time when people are most likely to say yes when you invite them to church. And so we want to we do our part and invite everybody we can to come back to church this Easter. Um, Family Forum is tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, I think it's right here in the sanctuary, and we're going to be going over some just ministry reports about things that have been going on in the life of our church. And we also have um, an update from the planning and renovation team uh, that's working on the building that was donated to us um, by... Brazos Valley Baptist Church, thank you PJ, and um, as well as a recommendation by the Finance Committee. So if you would like to come at 5 tonight, we're going to be presenting all those things so you can be a part of the vote uh, for, for how we move forward as a church. Um, this is so cool. In the foyer, we also have some family hymnals uh, that we have had for a while, and we would love to make them available to you and your family. They're in really good shape. They're just sitting out there um, in a box, and so if you would like to take one on your way to lifetime, uh, this is something, especially if you know how to play any instruments or piano or read music, man, it's something so cool to be able to sing uh, these wonderful hymns together. So grab one of those on your way to lifetime out there in the foyer. Senior Adult Game Night is back uh, on Tuesday uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, senior adults, you're welcome to come. Um, and they've told us that, hey, if anybody wants to come and play games and spend some time there, uh, we'd love to have you every Tuesday from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. They'll have a devotional and then play some games together. That's every Tuesday from 5.30 to 7.30 Wednesday night is back on in full force this week. Uh, some of our ministries took a break last week for spring break, but we are back in full force. Everything starts at 6 p.m. We have laugh and midweek for your kids and your students. We have men's ministry, women's ministry, prayer meeting. Uh, there's worship in here before all those adult ministries meet. Uh, it's, there's something for the whole family. So bring your family. Everything starts at 6 p.m. on Wednesday night. And uh, this Sunday is Men's Breakfast, and so if you are coming to church this next Sunday, um, please join us there for Men's Breakfast uh, before church. And then it is the beginning of Holy Week next week, and so we're so excited about all the things that we have going on at our church during Holy Week um, it is Palm Sunday. We're going to be having the kids. The children's choir is going to be leading us in worship, which I'm really excited about. Uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we're going to be having uh, community church services at noon. And we'll give you some more information about where those are in particular next week. Uh, we have on Thursday a Passover potluck that's going to be in the Fellowship Hall at 6 p.m. Uh, Friday is our Good Friday service here at noon. Saturday is the Gospel Pursuit. If you have kids in your family, uh, there is a little information in our bulletin about that. It's a scavenger hunt uh, centered around the gospel. Um, and so if you'd like to be a part of that, sign up uh, through the little QR code in your bulletin. And then finally, on Easter Sunday, we're having two services at 9.30 and 11 a.m. And so, again, get these cards, invite people to church, invite them to come. Uh, we would love to see the Lord just bring so many people uh, to faith on Easter Sunday. And so again, just invite them, bring them, bring them out on Easter. Um, Father Daughter is coming up soon. This is Saturday, April 17th. Um, we're bringing in a wonderful speaker, Eric Camp. He's going to be, uh, he did this a couple years ago for us. Wonderful, passionate, passionate guy, loves the Lord. And um, I'd actually like to invite Philip and Chloe Palmer are going to come up, and they're going to give us kind of a short testimony about the impact of father-daughter in their lives. Hello, church. I'm Philip, and this is my daughter, Chloe. Uh, we've, uh, we've done the, the father-daughter uh, deal here at the church the last couple of years, and uh, I highly recommend it. Highly, highly recommend it to anybody who's interested. Uh, it's just an, it's an excellent time to, to get together 
with, uh, with that special person in your life to, uh, to, to connect, to be silly, be serious. Uh, there's tons and tons and tons of activities that, that go on there. Um, and as soon as you show up, you can, you can easily see how much work uh, these folks have put into doing this deal, and it's, it's just an awesome, awesome time. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that uh, if we do the scavenger hunt this year, bird whales were coming for you. <laughs> so, huh, thank you. Okay, hold on one second. Oh, this one, in, there we go. Um, since you guys are up here, are y'all okay with just staying up here and doing the scripture and prayer for us this morning? Certainly, certainly. Okay, awesome. All right, they're going to do the scripture and prayer for us. All right. Chloe's going to read from uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only Son to the world that we might live through him. This is love that we not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Yeah. All right, church, why don't you pray with me? Dear Lord, we come to you today, blessed to be able to, to be in this place, to be together, to hear a good word, to hear your good word, Lord, your word of, of love. We ask you that you go with us, that you open our hearts, help us to, to hear this message, to internalize it, to, uh, to love on those around us with reckless abandon like you love us, Lord. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us. Let's continue to worship. Any 
so good. His love reaches so far. spoke a word you were singing over me you've been so so good to me for I drew a breath you breathed your life in me and you've been so so kind your foe, still your love far from me. You've been so, so good to me. And I felt no work, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so good.
wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Amen. As we sing this next song, I want to open up the altar this morning. I just want you to uh, bask in the love that he has for you this morning. His unsearchable, unquenchable, undefatigable, is that a word? His love for you. jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy and all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory He is jealous. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, Yeah. 
thank you that your love is not generic. It's not one size fits all. It's not tossed up, scattered in the wind. Whoever, whoever gets it, gets it. Lord, your love is powerful. It is pure. It is perfect. But most of all, Lord, it's personal. Not a person here this morning that you don't want to communicate your great love for. Lord, I'd be the first to say the, the problem's not on your end, it's on our end. Father, for different reasons, we've hardened our hearts. We've hidden our hearts. Instead of running to you, Lord, we've run from you. Forgive us, Lord. And Lord, you know the, the prayer of my heart this entire week has been, has been one thing. God, let us receive your love this morning. We're not begging for it, Lord. We're not even asking for it. Help us to receive it, Lord. This great, life-changing love that you showed at the cross, but that you show us each day and every day. Speak, Lord. Speak clearly to our hearts. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, praise and, and worship team t today. What, what beautiful worship and and I think they really mean it. You know that? I think they really, they love Jesus. And it, it shows through their music, their singing, their playing. And uh, we're very thankful. Well, we're going to jump right in today. So open your Bible to Isaiah 54. Uh, we're continuing our series, Headline News from the Bible. And I'm not a historian, but I am a, a, someone who's loved history. I remember we had an old history book in our home, and, and I would take that at night and, and read it until I fell asleep and, and just loved the idea of history and the, just the stories of history and, and really, uh, I don't know, they just drew me in. Well, this week I took a little detour from my normal activities, and I went down to the Graham Leader, and uh, I spent part of an afternoon, I could have spent the whole day, I could, have, I could spend weeks down there it was and just going through uh the headlines through the archives of the graham leader and i want to show you several things that i found i found this very interesting the first uh edition of the graham leader was august 19th 1876 and major jonathan w graves printed the first the first edition and became the was the publisher and the printer of the graham leader Think about it, 1876, that was the year Alexander Graham Bell got his patent for the telephone. That was the year Custer made his last stand uh, against the Sioux and the Kiowa Indian. I mean, this, there, this is a long, long time ago. And so here's the first edition, and then I was thumbing through it. I found one from, the from 1921. Actually, I think I found several of these on the Internet. Look when, what does it say? What? Yeah, more gushers in the South Bend field. Yeah, oil in 1921 was a big thing around Graham. Okay, look at the next one. 1940, okay. What does that say? 25,000 barrel well near Graham. Anybody own that? Anybody? <laughs> Lord, let him be a tither. That's my, that's my prayer for this wonderful person. Uh, King football, 1957, steers. Steers beat Jacksboro 59 to nothing, and the beat goes on. Here's one I, th I think you'll really appreciate. This was from uh, January 1979. Winter storm strikes Graham with crippling effect. Man, deja vu all over again. Here we go. And uh, then I want to show you uh, one more. This was the year that my family moved uh, to Graham. And... Uh, Big news, both the basketball and the baseball team made it to the state finals. Unfortunately, they didn't win either one of those games, but, but I knew I was in a sports uh, town when we came to Graham. 
Well, I want you to meet somebody, a good friend of mine, a fellow uh, member here of Oak Street. Tim O'Malley is the only uh, man named O'Malley that's not Irish that I know, okay, in the universe. So, Tim, come on up. You're our publisher. Let's welcome Tim O'Malley. Tim's been a faithful member of Oak Street since he and his family moved here. I knew you were going to do so. Okay, turn turn around. Not fake news is what the what the hat says. You can. Oh man, you can, you can leave it on. You can leave it on. Okay. Anyway, I was thought you know headline news of the Bible and and you know the news print media industry has changed so much over the the last few years with with uh, social media and the internet and everything. But I I love getting the Graham Leader. I do. I enjoy reading it. And, uh, the, you know, not just the headlines and the stories uh, of people in our community, but also the, the pictures that, that I get to see. And, and uh, so anyway, I've got five questions here. Thank you. What was that? Yeah. Uh, oh, we're not done yet. Get your attention. Oh. Oh, yes. We need to get you a microphone. <laughs> of course. We've only got 50 up here to choose from. Let me see. Okay. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you, Sound Booth. <laughs> you saved Tim. Okay, Tim, here we go. Uh, question number one. What? You're the publisher of the Graham Leader. I've wondered this and never asked anybody. What's the difference between a publisher and an editor? Well, the editor... Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> the editor is actually responsible for gathering the news of the community and putting it together into the newspaper. And so he's head of one department, whereas the publisher is head of many departments, and as well as gathering news, circulation, uh, distribution, sales, I mean, the, the whole gambit. So he's basically the, CEO, like the executive producer. The CEO of the company to make sure everything is running forward. Okay, so I guess I'm getting at, if we have a real gripe, something really in our craw, do we send a letter to the editor? Or, okay, to well, the no, publisher. Send okay. the letter to the editor. <laughs> yes, yeah, to the So editor. he can gather the news and put it in the paper. Okay. What is, the, what is the best part about being in the newspaper industry? The, in all honesty, the best part is that it's the only industry that I'm aware of that serves the whole community as a whole. In the same way a church ministers to the community and their needs and so forth, the newspaper is probably the number two. And that is that we have a responsibility to get the news, the facts, to the people so that they are informed, so they know what's going on within the community. How many people go to meetings to count city council? Well, you need to be informed, so we go for you. And we inform the public of all that, as well as if the newspaper does how it's designed, it actually benefits the whole community as a whole as far as businesses, not just advertising locally to, to help the businesses thrive, but we try to get you know, advertising even outside our area to bring fresh and new money. So just to continue to make it grow and a community thrive as a whole. Okay, thank you. Here's, here's probably my, the heart of my questions. And, and, and it's more like a question I don't think I'd ever asked, but I've always wondered, you know, just never verbalized. How do you decide what's going to be the headline of, of each newspaper and the, the main story? I mean, when it's, when it's not just obvious, obvious, how do you, who decides and how do you decide what's going to be that that main story the editor actually makes that decision since he's he or she is actually gathering the news we take the top three stories that of all the content and sometimes it may only be a ribbon cutting you know but the most important is always above the fold of the most of the top three stories that we publish okay that is that made by one person or a, little, a group it's by decision? one person okay okay I'm, i need to go talk to the editor we need some <laughs> we need some press is what i'm saying Okay, what is the, the, the news scoop in history you'd like to have? I mean, as a newspaper man, what is that thing that happened? That, man, I wish I'd have gotten the scoop on that story. Truth? Yeah, let's tell the truth. We're in church. <laughs> um, the news scoop, in all honesty, is for me to be back at the garden and ask Adam, why'd you do it? <laughs> You know, and this, and as a reporter, you know, we, we get a lead. You know, so you cover the lead at the beginning of this series. You know, the man has fallen. 
And then if we look through Scripture, we have the follow-through, which is in the book of Revelation, and then all in, everything in between. But there's one thing that's not in here that if there was a press, we would have covered. Adam, why did you do it? He's standing next to his wife. Satan comes up, tempts her, and he's like, this whole time, he's like, I, I know God. I told you that God said not to eat of this fruit. He says, don't touch it. But he stands by and didn't do a thing. And then he decides to go ahead and eat it himself. There's no sin in the garden. No one was influenced. He didn't have that seed of sin in his own life. So again, that's the question. And I can't find it in here. So Adam, why'd you do it? That would be the scoop. That would be the scoop. Good. I'm glad you were listening to the sermon. At least. <laughs> I thought I covered that. Okay. Last question, Tim. If, if, if you could wave the magic wand and everybody in the whole world had to read this edition of the Graham Leader, what would your cover story be? Well, this would be my favorite. Um, the headline above the hold would, fold would be in bold letters on the top, why I did it, dot, dot, dot. And it would have been from God. Because my question is, God, you created mankind. You knew in chapter 3 of Genesis that to already set up for a savior. You go through, you see the battles of what mankind has done, you know, to him and just ignoring him, committing world adultery, you know, and then he plans the plan of salvation that we see in the New Testament, and then we get to see in Revelation. And, and it ultimately comes down to that, God, if you knew that mankind was going to do this to you, and you didn't need us for anything, and everything you created was bring glory, well, we see that in all creation, but why us? Why would you create us? And the reason I think it's so important to know is that in what you've been covering about his love is that if people really got it, can you imagine how much in love we would be with him? Your passage this morning about what is love. If we really understood God and we read that, it's like, I wouldn't have any animosity towards any of my so-called brothers and sisters in Christ. It would change the community. It would change the world. That's what I would have. That's what I, let's thank Tim. Thank you, Tim. Great job, my brother. Thank you. Well, he raised a lot of more questions in my mind. I'm going to have to go back to the, the word. We're, we're talking about headline news from the Bible. The first week we did Genesis 3. We talked about the fall of mankind. And like, like Tim said, everything, every sin, on the hatred and bigotry and crime and everything we see comes out of that one seed, that seed in the garden where man turned their back on God. Then last week, we talked about the miracle that saved God's people out of Exodus chapter 14. How God and Moses working together parted the Red Sea. Now, I know, I know God could have done it without Moses, but he chose not to. And I know God can do a lot of great things by himself, anything he wants to, but he's chosen to use people, you and me, to make a difference in the world. So today we're going to talk about God declares his unbreakable love. And I hope you'll see, you know, out of all the things that we could say are headlines in the Bible, I hope, honestly, I hope, by the end of this message, you'll say, now I see why that's one of the major headlines of the scripture. You see, the Bible is not primarily a history book. It's not, although it has history in it. The Bible is not a, a book of science. It's not a book of facts or rules or work. The Bible is the greatest love story ever written. And it's the greatest love letter that's ever been written. And I'm hoping this morning not for information or even inspiration, but revelation and transformation. Do, do you really believe that you can walk out of here a different person than you came in, changed by the love of God? Do you think God's love is that strong, that powerful, that able to change you completely? And you'd walk out of here different than you came in. And if you say, I, I, I really believe that can happen, you're right. If you say, I don't believe that can happen, you're right. 
Think about that for a little bit, okay? That's the mind bender of the day. Okay, before we begin, before we, we get into this passage in Isaiah 54, that just every time I read it, it, it kind of takes my breath away. It probably should more. But at least I go, oh my goodness, when I read this passage. Before we get there, I want to I go to two other passages, uh, w- the one that Chloe read and then one more, just to see why this is so significant and so important. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Paul says, If I speak in tongues of men and, or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to the hardship or the flames, some translations, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The Bible is very clear that we can do all these amazing, incredible things, but if love is not the driver and the motivation... And if you and I are not living a life of love, they mean nothing. I mean, the the most spectacular thing you've ever seen, the most remarkable, unbelievable thing you've ever seen or done, it's nothing unless it's motivated by love. And the second passage in 1 John chapter 4, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them, that's that's transforming right there this is how love is made complete among us so that we'll have confidence on the day of judgment in this world we are like jesus there's no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment the one who fears is not made perfect in love we love because he loved us first and i believe it was providential had a something i went to the gym this week and and i you know was gonna listen to uh, Joyce Meyer broadcast. I just like the way she presents things. And she talks about how our soul and spirit are connected, and living out that in a daily life. And so, so I I turn it on. I'm on the treadmill and I'm and I'm going. Boy, these these earphones they just don't work like they used to. Man, maybe I maybe I forgot to charge them. Well, I got done with the message and took off my earphones and so I'd never turned them on. And so the whole gym, I wondered why everybody's giving me dirty looks, you know, everybody looking over there, what do you know, because man, Joyce was, she was preaching it to the gym rats the other morning. And uh, so anyway, but what she, what I heard through my earphones, in spite of my earphones, she said this passage that she'd known it for years as a Christian, and then one day it just, the truth came to her. It was the revelation of how true that was, and it just changed her life forever. And she said something that's really good. Yes, we need to get into the Word of God, but it's even better when the Word of God gets into us. I mean, there's one thing about sitting there and reading your Bible, studying, memorizing, meditating on the Word of God, and that's none of that. That's all necessary and, and good. But when God's Word gets into us, and we truly believe that the words on this on these pages were for us and to us it will absolutely change our life if we live in love we live in god that, that seems to say to me if we don't live in love then we're really not living in god god is love and there's nothing more important than knowing god loves you And most of us have this idea. I believe this with all my heart. We have this idea. Yeah, God, he he loves me, but he really will love me if I do better. If I straighten up, if I read the Bible more, if I have a quiet time, if I memorize scripture, if I go to church, if I witness on the job site, I mean, if I can just get my act together, God will will really, truly love me. And to to get it out of our head into our heart, He loves you right now, just as you are. If you don't improve, if you don't get better, you say, well, what is the motivation then to do better and get better? It's love. It's being fully loved. Listen, that's the the driving force that God wants to. God could threaten you and me every day. He could wake you up in the morning and say, you better fly straight. 
You better toe the line. You better do everything I tell you to do and do it when I say do it or else. God's chosen not to do that. God motivates us by love and through love and with love. And the more you and I understand the love of God for us, not us generic, but for you and for me personally, our lives will become much, much more than we could ever been on our own. So, I want to read this uh, love letter from God. Isaiah is the, the prophet who gives the clearest picture of who Messiah is going to be, what Messiah is going to look like, although it's going to be 700 years till Messiah comes. And he writes to God's people who have wandered from God or strayed from God or are care less about God, who are indifferent about God. And he writes this, this love letter. And, and let me just say this as we, as we jump into this. There's nothing better than to love and be loved. There's nothing greater than to love and to be loved. There's nothing more powerful. There's nothing more life transforming. Nothing in all the world like love. So let's read this. Isaiah 54, 5. It says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you're a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandon you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. To me, this is like the day of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace removed says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Now, we're going to dive into this scripture in just a few minutes, but, but I want to give you what I call news for the heart. And again, it's one thing when we know something in our head, and, and most everything begins with information. But if it, if it doesn't go past that, if all we do is come down here and get some more head knowledge about who God is and what God does and what we're supposed to do, then we're missing the whole boat. God wants this to be heart news. He wants our heart to understand His love. He wants our heart to be, to be changed and our heart to be drawn to that love. And I know life, you know, it's just like Life is life and just got to get up and got to go to work and come home, eat supper and go to bed so I can get up and go to work. And, and we get in that routine and we forget this, this is a love story. That's what Tim was trying to say. This is the love story of all time. And so just, just five quick statements. Number one, God's love is unmerited. It can't be earned. You know, I think we have uh, more pilots and more Eagle Scouts at Oak Street than any church per capita in the world. Got a lot of you who, who were Eagle Scouts, and you earned those badges, and you earned those patches and those ribbons and all those things on your uniform. And when we have that Eagle Scout service, we come together and we say, man, you worked hard. Man, you deserve this. Look at the projects you did. Look at all you accomplished. Look, look at all that you went through, and now you're an Eagle Scout. And I think some of us think, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever be an Eagle Scout Christian. I don't think I'll ever get enough patches. I don't think I'll ever do enough projects and get enough good things for, for God to feel that way about me. And the good news is God's love is unmerited. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to get a badge from God. The second thing, God's love is unlimited. The prayer of Ephesians 3, Paul says, here's what I'm praying for you. That the, you would know the height and depth and length and breadth of God's love though it uh, though it is unknowable he says you can't ever know it all but I want to give you what 
what you can know. I want to pray for you. It surpasses knowledge. As you well know, there are 326 million trillion gallons of water in the world. Right? You knew that. So if you drink a gallon a day, it would take you 300, no, excuse me, 32 quadrillion, 100 trillion lifetimes to drink all that. And listen, the, the, the water in the world is a drop in the bucket compared to God's love. It's infinite. The third thing, it's unconditional. It's not based on your IQ, your beauty, your talents, your family history, your GPA, your, your looks. And guess what? God's love for you is not even based on your willingness to reciprocate. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. God's love is unending. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says, I've been convinced neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor heights nor depths nor things present nor things to come will separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your, your bad habit, your, your worst attitude will not separate you from God's love. The end of this life, if you're in Christ, will not separate you from God's love. It will continue throughout eternity. And number five, God's love is unbreakable. Years ago in our seminary chapel, E.V. Hill said something I'll never forget. He said, you can break God's heart, but you cannot break his love. How true. You can reject God's love. You can refuse it. You can misuse it. You can abuse it. You can resist it. But you cannot break God's love. God loves you. And I know that's kind of like, oh, okay, that's nice. I thought I was going to hear something new this morning. thought I'd hear a little different. It, it's not ho-hum. And it's not, so what's the big deal? If you and I can grasp this, if we can receive this, if we can believe this, if we can take this into our life, it will absolutely change us from the inside out. So let's, let's look at this scripture. I want to walk through Isaiah 54, 5 through 10. And the first thing I see is the romance. Our lover revealed. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. I heard about the fourth grader in Sunday school, and they were talking about something along these lines. And the fourth grader says, yeah, I remember Solomon. He had 700 wives and 300 cucumbers. <laughs> you know, we don't quite get the story, but I, I think we kind of feel like, yeah, it's kind of like Solomon. Yeah, you know, 700 wives just kind of spread it out, you know, and it just kind of, I'm just one of a crowd. Instead of 700, it's, it's 7 billion. And I'm just one of 7 billion, and God gives each of us a, a one seven billionth of his love. Some of us see God's love as kind of like this, this scattergun approach. I mean, God stands back with a scattergun and just, you know, just blows love everywhere. God's love is a 30 odd 6 and it's aimed directly at our heart. It's passionate. It's fierce. It's focused. Isaiah said, let me tell you about your lover. He is El Shaddai, the God Almighty. He's the God of Israel. He's the God of the whole earth. I read this week about a little girl who was in the, there was at home in a, a bad lightning storm. And she kept crying for her mom to come, crying for her mom to come. And every time her mom would come in and comfort her and leave, and she'd cry out for her mom. And finally the mom said, hey, honey, don't you know Jesus is with you all the time? And she says, mom, I just need somebody with skin on him. <laughs> and I understand that, I mean, that need that we have, Right. But it starts before that. You can have a lot of people skin on who love you that doesn't get your heart to where it needs to be. We need to really understand the God of all the earth. Your lover made you for love. You know, I wonder about people like Cindy Jackson, 61 years old, and she's had 54 cosmetic surgeries. I wonder about Felix Bumgarten, 
who skydived from 126,000 feet to the earth. I wonder about these, these kids that, that fill their life with drugs and alcohol and all these things, and they're, they're, just, they're just like searching and looking. And it comes back to what Pascal said. There is a God-shaped hole in every one of us that no one can fill except God. And that's the truth. God made you, and God put within each of us a God-shaped hole. And only his love can fill it. And you can have all the money in the world. And you can have all the fame and the glory and accolades of the world. You can try every thrill and chill there is out there. But until you experience God's love, that hole will never be filled. It's just, it's a bottomless pit. And you run here and you run there and you try this and you try that. You think, man, if I was just a little more popular at school. Man, if I could just make the first team. Man, if I could just get this promotion or this raise or make this much money, then I would be satisfied. And the truth is, God's love fits perfectly in your heart and nothing else will. Your lover made you for love, but also your lover marks you for love. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, for he chose us in him. He chose us in him before the foundations of of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ he created us he made us he formed us he marked us out for his love think about it God can have anything he wants I mean who who, who could stop God from having anything he wanted and he wants you and again, it's not in that generic sense, oh yeah, well God wants everybody. It's kind of like the draft. No, God wants you. He made you for his love. God marked you for his love. He singled you and I out, the God of all the universe. Maybe you've heard of her. Her name is Lizzie Velazquez. When Lizzie was 17 years old, a very most of us would say a very important time of, of her life. Somebody told her about something on YouTube, and she went there, and she saw an eight-second YouTube of her, a picture of her, and it was titled, The World's Ugliest Woman. And if that wouldn't be enough of a dagger in your heart, she looked, and there had been over four million views of her. And if that wasn't enough, she read, the, she read the comments. The person who said, you're a monster. The person who said, why don't you blow your head off and we'll be through with you. The person who said, you'd be better off if we just set you on fire. And she was devastated. But in her devastation, in her absolute heartbreak she ran to the Lord and you can go on YouTube now and there are 54 million views for her her message that you are loved by God that you are special to God that you are chosen by God that you're made for God for his love the second truth is the is what I call the rejection how love was betrayed Verse 6 says, the Lord will call you back as if you were a wife, deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married only to be rejected, says your God. I think it's kind of a toss-up, at least it is in my mind, between what, what emotion is the, is the most devastating. And I think it's between shame and rejection. I know both of those are very, very painful. Some of, the, some of the most difficult times in my ministry have been setting him off as when someone talks about them being rejected. He's divorcing me. She's leaving me. They found someone else. They told me I had to be out of the house. And you can just feel the pain emanating from their heart. Mild rejection. Ah, you didn't make the team. Well, you didn't get that part in the play. And it still hurts. It still touches our heart. 
but the most severe. I never want to see you again. I hate you. Get out of my life. I am personally convinced that most of our addictions are because of the pain of rejection or abuse or neglect. And we run to these things that we believe will ease the pain of rejection or, or abuse or neglect. And the truth is, God's love is the only remedy. All of us have been rejected at some level. All of us been, have been abused at some level. All of us have been neglected at some level. And we either run to God for the healing of His love, or we run from God to our addictions, to things that will destroy our life. Why would we run from God? Because of the lies of the enemy. The enemy lies to you. He, God loves you. Look in the mirror. If you think God loves you, look in the mirror and you see. Look at what he's made. Look, what he, look who you are. Why would God allow that to happen to you? Why would a loving God who can do anything, why would it allow you to go through that loss, to go through that abuse, to go through that neglect? Satan and sin tell us to distrust God's love. All the way back to Genesis 3. If God loved you, he wouldn't hold out on you. That tree in the middle of the garden, he'd give it to you if he loved you. And he's repeated that line and that lie millions of times. If God loved you, you wouldn't have had an alcoholic father. If God, if God loved you, he would stop that abuse that, that's going on in your home. And you see, there's where we have the choice. We either believe and receive the lies of sin and Satan, and we harden our hearts, and we put up this wall against God. And it becomes kind of like, yeah, at arm's length, yeah, God, you and I are going to get along fine. I'm going to keep you at a safe distance. I'm never going to let you control my life. I know who you are. I appreciate the blessings of life, but I'm never going to let you in. Satan and sin tells us to disdain God's love. I'm hoping this morning something said would be like what happened in my life 35 years ago. I was listening to a broadcast to focus on the family. And a Korean orphan girl was, was talking. And she said she was half American and half Korean. A soldier in the war had gotten a young Korean lady pregnant. And so she was, she was called an alien devil. Her mother abandoned her. And for seven years, she lived on the streets in, in Korea. And she said the things she saw and the things she's ex experienced, every time something bad happened, she would harden her heart just a little bit more to protect her from getting hurt again. And so by the time she's seven years old and World Vision sees her and takes her into the orphanage, she is one hard case. She is one person with a mile-high wall in her life. And for two years, they let her work at this orphanage, taking care of the babies, because that was their, their main focus and their main concern. And one day, she said, a couple from America came, and they knew they were coming, and she, she washed and cleaned all the babies, got them all ready for the, you know, for the inspection. And the young couple came in and said the man looked over at her. And she saw something she'd never, ever seen in her life. She saw compassion in someone's eyes. Someone's eyes. And so he comes over to her. Her heart, everything in her heart is crying out to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted. And the man leaned over to her and she spit in his face. That's, that's crazy. That's insane. That makes no sense at all. It makes as much sense as what you and I do, running from God's love. God, we want you to love us, but don't, no, no, not now, not that way. No, God, I, I, I want you, but I don't. And in a sense, 
We're disdaining the love that God has for us. We're rejecting His great love. The third truth is the redemption. The wooing love of God. For a brief moment, I abandon you. But with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. There's, a, there's another spring town. You may not have heard of it, but it's Springtown, Arkansas. It's just a little wide place in the road going between Gentry and Heifel. So now you know where it is. And the only thing really in Springtown is a little assembly of God church. And I remember the day after I heard that the pastor of that church's 17-year-old son had been killed in a car wreck. And he was a good kid. He was good looking. He was personal. He was a football player. I mean, just every, had everything going for him. And he was killed in this car wreck. And I was driving through Springtown and a sign next to the church said this. Weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And I thought, what a declaration of faith. How that, that pastor and his wife could say something like that. Listen, all of us have had moments in our life that have tested our faith. And, and times when the, when the enemy just comes in and says, see, there's the proof. God doesn't love you. God doesn't love yours. God doesn't love them. I remember receiving a call from a, a couple. They had prayed for years for a child. And finally, the, the young woman had gotten pregnant. And they were so excited. And the baby was born, stillborn. And they asked me to come down to the funeral home. And I walked into that room. And there was this, this young man and this young husband and wife. And they were just staring at this little coffin. A little bigger than a shoebox. And I went over to him and I sat down beside him and I started to weep. I had no words to say. I had no comfort to offer. All I had was a broken heart. Lord, you, you probably remember that phone call. Years ago, I watched a grown man crawl into the hospital bed and hold his daughter in the last hours of her life. And I was broken, and I left that room, and I went and I called Lowell, and I was weeping. I could hardly talk, and I said, Lowell, I'm not cut out for this stuff. I, I, I can't do this. And we've all had those moments where it just seemed like, God, God, if you really love me, it, it wouldn't go this way. Why does the God of miracles do nothing? Absolutely Nothing. I pray, I believe, I ask, and God does nothing. God's love is passionate. Two times he says, with compassion, nobody loves you more fiercely and fully than God does. Romans 5.8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means, and while we were yet sinning, Christ died for us. At the moment of your, your worst sin, your deepest sin, your habitual sin, Christ was hanging on that cross. And you know, I think we, about this time of year, you know, we take notice of the cross, and it's kind of like it's a movie poster to us. Hey, come, to, come see the cross. Come see the play. Come see the special activities. Rated PG. Instead of a love letter written by the blood of Christ to you and to me. He loves us fiercely. On the day of my wedding, somebody handed me something. It was a love letter from the woman I was going to marry. 
And I read it and read it and reread it and taped it in my Bible. I knew there's one book I'm going to be in every day. And I want to see that love letter. Christ has written us a love letter. God's love is passionate. No one loves you more fiercely, more fully than, than God does. And God's love is present. Years ago, a preacher left the south coast of Massachusetts and rode a boat out to Nantucket to do a vacation Bible school for kids. And uh, they were doing the vacation Bible school, and he asked the kids, he says, where is the Atlantic Ocean? And none of the kids knew. And he wanted to say to the kids, you're surrounded by it. You're completely encircled by the Atlantic Ocean, and yet you don't even know what it is. And so it is with the love of God. A kind word of a friend. A pat on the back, a nice word, a text saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Just the beat of our heart, the breath in our lungs. Every bit of that is God saying, I love you. I truly love you with all my heart. I walked with a family through a deep, deep, dark valley. And it didn't end the way we had hoped, I had hoped, and we had prayed. It ended out at the graveside. And if I've ever felt the love of God for a family, I mean, I felt it. it I don't even know what to say. It just, I knew that the love of God was filling my heart. And I leaned over to a member of that family and I said, I love you. And they looked up at me and they said, yeah, right. I was devastated. How many of us God is trying to say to us each and every day, I love you. And we're responding, yeah, right. Yeah, sure you do. Yeah, maybe so, maybe no. And then finally, the reassurance Knowing that God's love is unbreakable. Isaiah 54, 9. To me, this is like the day of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken and my covenant of peace will not be removed from you, says the Lord who has compassion on you. In Genesis 6, the Bible says God looks at the world, the people of the world, and said every inclination of their heart was toward evil. Every thought of their mind was evil. And God regretted that he had made mankind. And so God, through the flood, destroys, destroys every, every one, everything in the world except for one man and his family. Noah, his wife, and, and three children and, and their wives. And so these eight are saved. But after this flood, God says, I'm going to do something. He says, I'm putting a rainbow in the sky. And that rainbow is my covenant with you. And every time I look at that rainbow, I will be reminded of my covenant that I have made with you never to destroy the world by water again. And Isaiah is saying, God, the God who made that covenant with Noah and mankind is making a covenant with you. And his covenant is a covenant of love. Now, let me tell you something I've learned over the years. And it didn't come to me. It didn't just wasn't one of these things you just kind of figured out. I mean, it just came to me one day. No relationship is stronger than the covenant that they make. That's, that's why we have marriage ceremonies. And my son Abe and, and Caitlin's fiance who are getting married next month, you know, they were talking about the vows. And I said, please understand, when we say vows, that's, that's, that's really like a cheap form of what we're talking about. We're talking about a covenant. 
that you are making a covenant of your life to one other person before God. That's, that's the strength of your marriage. It's not your emotions. It's not your neighborhood. It's not your kids. It's the covenant that you make that will see you through the hard times and the difficult times and the dark times. The love of God is promised. I have sworn to you. You know, Christ likeness looks, I mean, there's a lot of different facets and perspectives and, and looks at, at, at being Christ like, but one of them is faithfulness. It's keeping your promises. And you find with me, very seldom will I say, oh yeah, I'll be there. Oh yeah, you can count on me. I, I, I rarely say things like that. I say, I, I'll try to be there, or I'll see if I can be there. I don't want to make promises that I'm not keeping. Listen, God is a covenant-keeping God. He cannot and He will not break His promise of love to you. There's nothing you can do to, to make God break that promise. It is His, it is his covenant You ever seen that the movie uh, Last of the Mohicans? And they're at the climactic scene. Uh, Hawkeye, the hero of the of the story, is is talking uh, to to the love of his life, a woman named Cora. And the enemy's coming and getting ready to you know it looks it looks like Hawkeye is running from the battle, but he's not. He's living to fight another day. And right before he leaves, here's what he tells Korah. No matter what occurs, I will find you. No matter where you go, no matter how long it takes, I will find you. The love of God is permanent. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my covenant of love will never be shaken. And my peace will never be removed. If everything around you falls apart. If your best friend betrays you. If the world and everything in it turns its back on you. The love of God will still be there. You can't shake God's love. You can't break God's love. It is infinitely for you. And about a week and a half ago my Mentor, former pastor Peter Lord passed away. And he was a man who walked with God. And he was, I mean, he traveled the world with the message, spend time with God, experience God. And one year he came to speak at the, at the uh, James Robinson Bible Conference. And I didn't go, but I got a tape of his message. And I remember I was so, I was so uh, discouraged, so disheartened. There I was, a third-year se uh, seminary student. I was doing everything I could to please God and to earn God's favor and to get God to use me. And it just felt like I couldn't do enough. If you pray an hour, you could always pray an hour and a half. If you witness to one person, you should have witnessed to two persons. And on and on and on it went. And I just felt myself just getting deeper and deeper and deeper in despair and discouragement. And I listened to this message that he preached called, believe it or not, Turkeys and Eagles. And at the end of the message, I turned off the tape player and God spoke to me. It wasn't the message from Peter Lord. It was the message from God. And what God said to me was, I love you just the way you are. You don't have to get better. You don't have to do better. You don't have to be better. I love you just the way you are. 
that transformed my life. That's, that was, I can look back and say that was one of the points in my life where everything changed. So let's just apply this. First of all, I would say to you, believe God's love for you. You've got, you've got to believe it. You've, you've just got to say, I, I truly do. I just believe God loves me just the way I am right now. Don't have to look better and do better. He loves me. I believe that. The second is receive it. The way we receive God's love is we, we take down that, that stiff arm. We quit keeping God at a safe distance. We say, bring it. <laughs> bring it. My heart is a receptacle for your love. And Chris and I each learned a new word this week. Here's mine, transceive. It is a word. It means you give and receive. You give and receive. You receive God's love. And you share God's love with others. And as we do that, God just, it's just this cycle. But instead of a downhill spiral, it's, it's an uphill climb into more and more and more the glory of God's love. And let me just say this one more time. It's not what you know up here. It's what you believe here. And there's some of us, many of us who, who have this in our heart. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah, but. And I know what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I know. the. Yeah, right, right, right. You're right, but. No. No. God's love is for you. He will fill you up with his love if you let him. Let's pray. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I wish I could, uh, you know, had a picture an x-ray of, of my heart and just show you what happened that night when I truly believed that God loved me as I was. Just as I was. No better, no worse, no different. And I would ask you this morning, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ, you've never given your life to Christ, you've never been born again, saved, converted, that you would open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, save me, change me, make me yours forever. But you see, that's not the, that's not the last, that's the beginning of a love relationship with God. And the evil one with his lies and his deception just keeps chipping away at us. Saying, you, you, you know you should have done that. You know you shouldn't have done that. You don't deserve God's love. How can he love someone like you? Here's the great news. God loves you. He loves you perfectly, personally, powerfully. He wants you to experience His love so that you may share His love with others. So we're going to pray, and I'm, well, I'll ask you to stand after we pray. And the altar is open. Man, I hope your heart's open. I hope your heart's open this morning. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love letter. Thank you for your heart of love for us. Lord, please, by your spirit, Lord, please open hearts to receive your love this morning.
in this place, in this moment. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. And ask you to stand with me. And, and, uh, you know, to sing and worship the Lord, that's great. But you know what God really wants this morning? He wants an open heart. in their place Lord it is your home that commands the morning even oceans in glory stars in their place Lord it is your home that commands the morning even oceans in their way this church till you believe it.